A cry for help. Prime Minister Gillatet looked up from the display and out the window. He couldn't see them in the sky, but he knew they would arrive soon. The screens had just informed him of the final destruction of their fleet, along with the final words of Admiral Ton. I'm sorry, was all he could say as his capital ship cracked in two. The Ossians knew the swarm was coming for some time and had done their best to prepare, but it simply wasn't enough. They could have had twice the amount of time, and they still wouldn't have been able to face down the unstoppable tide that had now arrived. Their shapes now visible, if infinitesimally small in the sky, were unmistakable. It could only be them. Ship after ship of twisted chitin and biomass. They had no official name, refusing to answer communications, so they were dubbed the Swarm or the Infestation, or a million other words that all meant the same general thing. Death. The dots had gotten larger, hundreds moved towards the planet, towards his people, towards their next meal. Planetary defences could hold them for a few minutes, perhaps, but the inevitable was upon them. The parasites seemed to know that as their armada seemed the wrong word. Their number split. Only an eighth continued their momentum towards Ossia Prime. The rest headed towards the edge of the system and on to the yet untouched systems of the Ossian Principality. The Prime Minister chuckled. The absurdity that it was a heated debate, not but a few months ago, whether or not to finally do away with that name, a holdover from an older time. The government had been democratic for ages, generations upon generations now, but they'd had a single ruler once. Some on the council argued it was history, others argued that it was time to move on. None of it mattered now, the swarm did not care for names or the people who came up with them. Boom! They were here. The planetary defense grip lit up with contacts and let fly their plasma salvos. The swarm's ships pushed through mostly unharmed. Their kittenous hulls seemed specifically suited to protect against plasma and heat. It made sense in a way the Prime Minister supposed the fleshy interior wouldn't do well against heat, so they'd probably evolved, or perhaps consciously grew to protect themselves from it. They weren't without weapons themselves either. Their energy pulses tore through the defense grid shields just like they did the fleet. Beyond that, they seemed content to simply crash through anything big enough to withstand a pulse, putting their sheer mass to use. Ossian scientists suspected they had other, more conventional weaponry as well, and simply opted not to use what they deemed unnecessary. It was silent in the command centre. Twenty-two people, scientists, ensigns, aides and defence specialists, all watched as their best-laid plans were simply not enough. As the lights from each bastion went out, as the swarm overwhelmed them, Gillatet's hand mused over his personal datapad. He pulled up the distress call they'd sent out to the greater galactic community a few weeks ago. Once they'd realized the magnitude of the threat they faced, the Prime Minister asked, pleaded for assistance. But the messages either never came back or came back in solemn apology. Some systems sincerely could do nothing to help, either too weak or too far away. Others, it seems, decided it was best to throw the Ossians in front of them. They would be the fodder that allowed them to build up defences and consolidate holdings. Please, we face annihilation, anyone. Ossia will be forever in your debt. We don't have the military power to stop them. Think of the billions of lives. His own voice pleaded back to him. The defence grid sat in tatters, only a few groupings of lights held out, swarm ships hurtled towards landfall. The silence in the room was deafening, unbearable, but then it was broken. Sir, FTL signatures detected. More. What did the swarm need with even more force? It would seem their numbers were greater than we thought, Gillatet sighed to the ensign. Sir. The signatures aren't swarm in nature, they're Terran. Not possible. His stomachs fluttered with hope. But wait, 
If they're dropping out of light speed just now, it'll still take time for them to reach the planet. That's just it, sir. They're dropping out of FTL directly above the planet. Sure enough, a cacophony of sound all but shook the ground as hulking metal appeared just behind the chitinous swarm. Hundreds of ships dropped out of FTL, all of them absolutely brimming with weaponry. Definitely the humans. Everything seemed to pause for a moment. Even the swarm seemed to stop. A transmission. Ossia Prime, this is the Seventh Terran Battle Fleet. Hope we're not too late to the party. The silence, like glass, was shattered by the pulse crack of what must be the Terran's flagship. A truly gigantic work. It was less a ship armed with cannons and more one big cannon that had a ship and an engine strapped to it. The single salvo let loose from this gargantuan weapon smashed through six swarm dreadnoughts. Their chitin shells cracked and shattered. The rest of the Terran ships took this as their cue to open up, raining plasma and kinetic fire on any and all swarm ships. Chaos erupted as the swarm seemed to gain consciousness again. Reversing course, they let energy pulse after energy pulse go. Following up, they collided with a number of human ships, following their tactics as usual. Tactics that didn't work. The larger human ships failed to lose their shields when hit with the energy pulses. As a result, the swarm vessels never impacted, instead breaking themselves against the implacable barriers. As they did so, the fields glowed a hot orange instead of the normal blue, and the swarm seemed to incinerate themselves wherever they made contact. Smaller ships did loose shields, though swarm vessels were met with tough armor and devastating salvos that never ceased, no matter how close the swarm ship came. Only a few Terran light corvettes sustained enough damage to go down. One corvette, understanding its fate, broke ranks with its fleet, but not to flee. Instead, it initiated a full burn and rocketed into the middle of a swarm formation, firing with abandon in every direction. Finally, it used its momentum to ram a much larger swarm cruiser. The velocity was enough to crack its hull, and instantly the corvette exploded in a massive ball of nuclear fire. The area of impact around the cruiser, a solid fourth of his full size, was utterly immolated. The Terran fleet also made great use of small, unshielded fighters. These fighters, with no shields to speak of, were generally unaffected by the energy pulses unless they strayed too close to their source. Their small nature also meant they were well quick enough to zip around the hurtling swarm ships. The fighters would wait for a vulnerability to present itself and then, ironically, swarm the swarm ship. They targeted the fleshy pods that generated the energy pulses with machine gun fire or launched thermite rockets into the breach points of cracked hulls. Any weakness was leapt upon and used to bring down the enemy. Prime Minister Gillotet came back to himself, roused from his trance by the cheering of his compatriots. The swarm fleet was all but annihilated. Their broken pieces fell to the planet, burning up upon re-entry into the atmosphere. Ha! Uh, sir, they, they're they hailing us. The ensign turned to the Prime Minister. Um, yes, yes, on screen immediately. The large screen that hung over the room switched from defense grid readouts to a bronze-skinned face. Despite the elation, he felt it was still unnerving to see a human with how utterly alien they were. Already large creatures, the big screen made the figure look even more imposing. All the sensory organs seemed to compactly sit within the face of the human. So odd. Another oddity that struck Gilatet was the difficulty in determining the human's sex. He knew humans had many genders, which was one point he could understand, but they only had two sexes. They classified as male and female but to tell the difference between the two was nearly impossible. He had been told there were physical traits that could serve as clues. Color was not one of those traits, as the first Ossian ambassador quickly and embarrassingly discovered on their first official meeting. Fur color was also not a reliable way, but fur length could be. 
Culturally, human females tended to wear their fur longer and males shorter, but this was entirely preferential and proved to be generally unreliable. Other physical traits were similarly difficult to make use of, given that human military all wore the same colors and style. Which made some sense to the Prime Minister. The order required in a military setting encouraged uniformity. Ultimately, the Ossian ambassadors simply gave in to the fact that if a human wished for an ambassador to know their sex or gender, they would simply say so. Still, to be unable to tell this of a human simply by their hue was interesting. But we figured that if you had the option between being blown to pieces by a botched FTL jump or infested and consumed by the swarm, you'd take the FTL jump, so we went with it. Gilletet realized he'd zoned out for the first half of the humans' transmission. Luckily, one of their generals covered. It was a brilliant tactical maneuver, friends. You won't see us complaining, the old voice spoke. Finally, finding their voice, Gilletet spoke up. Yes, of course, we're simply relieved someone answered. Truly, a moment ago we faced oblivion now. Well, we have our lives at least. Their mind drifted to the eighteen planets that had sat between the swarm's entry point into the galaxy and Ossia Prime. Suddenly it dawned on him that there was still an immense swarm fleet moving toward Kirkel. But, I must tell you humans, this was only a small portion of their number. A fleet eight times this size jumped towards the Kirkel system. Towards Kirkel, private. The human turned to someone off-screen. Lay in heading to Kirkel and let the others know. They seemed to get some sort of unheard confirmation as they nodded and turned back to the Prime Minister. Insanity. Sure, the rescue was incredible, but they simply don't have the number. A flashing light to his left indicated that four more FTL signatures had been detected at the edge of the system. They belonged to four more Terran fleets of the same size as the one that had just saved them. By the star's holy light, the human must have seen the look on Gilletet's face. I take it you've marked the eighth, ninth, tenth, and eleventh fleets. I see no reason not to be forward with you, Prime Minister. We fully intend to burn those parasites off the face of this galaxy. I personally swear to you that I will not let one more innocent life be taken by those bastards. Given that they've taken some damage, I will leave the Tatiana and the Oberon in orbit to help with clean-up and repair operations. I hope we will speak again when this is all over. Send work to Kirtkel if you can. Let them know help is coming. Chief Admiral Achebe, out. With that, the screen went dark, and the Terran fleet moved to link up with its counterparts. Gilletet watched as their markers moved to the edge of the system and blinked away. The Battle of Kirkel would come to be known as the beginning of the end for the swarm, as the bulk of their number were annihilated that day. The Terrans kept true to Admiral Achebe's word and did not rest until all of Ossian territory was free of the infestation. After this, humanity moved to return to their own space, but stayed on as Ossia requested assistance in border defense while they rebuilt. As many opportunistic eyes looked upon possible easy targets, they found Terran warships looking back and thought better. It didn't take long for Ossian ships to be frequently seen in Terran space, and eventually Ossian people found on Terran planets or humans on Ossian planets. The bureaucracy took some time to catch up, but it was a momentous day when the Osseo-Terran Federation was formed. This federation championed simple doctrine that it continues to uphold to this day. When you hear a cry for help, when another needs your aid, you answer, 